I kind of lost track of you after uh, after um, stalled out in the in the doorway came out in two thousand six. Yeah. It's a it's been a journey since then. Can we talk a little bit about? Um, I understand you had some some throat issues after yeah, that. I had that all about. So stalled out came out. Uh, I worked for two years up to that. And that came out. I did a bunch of touring. And um, after the like year touring, I won the Juno the, right. uh, in two thousand seven. And uh, the next day after Juno, I, uh, I woke up and I had strep throat pneumonia. And I flew to Los Angeles that day. And I was supposed to do all these uh, like showcases, kind of like what's going on today. Right. And um, my voice is gone. And so I saw this doctor, like Coldplay and Who's doctor in LA, gave me all this medicine, gave me prednisone shots and all this stuff. It's terrible for you. Prednisone's awful. It's awful stuff. Yeah. So he gave me all stuff to get through. And I was like a zombie. I was like a drugged up zombie trying to do these things. And, you know, it just progressively got worse. Um, over the next six months to a year, the point where I, I just couldn't sing anymore. And so I had two polyps and cysts on my vocal cords. Jesus. And uh, I had them removed eventually, um, and basically a quarter of my vocal cords taken out. And so it was three, three and a half years before. I mean, if I'd been a better patient, been like a really good patient, I was still pretty wild. Right. Uh, yeah. I was trying to, trying to heal up, but I was living a pretty crazy life. And um, I, it took, took me about three and a half years to be able to really kind of sing again. I wasn't gigging, I wasn't doing anything. I just kind of stopped everything because I just couldn't do it. That's pretty harsh. It was crazy. It was it, like I, I've said this tons of times. It's like being a runner and getting to the Olympics or getting to a big race, and uh, you just start doing well and pull a hamstring and you're, and you're out. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I thought it was life. You know, like maybe you had a kid or uh, yeah. to, you none know, that I know about. Right? Like yeah. Right. <laughs> no. So I, I wasn't sure what was going on. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was crazy. And so even I did a second record uh, in, two, in 2010. It came out in 2012. But I went to England. With, I was with uh, Chris Potter, who did the Verve Records, worked yeah. with the Stones, McCartney, everybody, Ash Richard Ashcroft, Soul stuff. And uh, I ended up leaving Warner Brothers a month after that record came out because uh, it just wasn't the right fit. It wasn't real. Yeah. I wasn't where I was supposed to be, you know, and uh, it wasn't benefiting them or me or anybody really. And funny enough, my first record uh, stalled out the doorway, and, you know, my career stalled out. It kind of was, yeah. it just, you know, my voice was gone, and then. You know, momentum slows down and eventually stops, and then trying to pick it up again. And you know, I just had to have a lot of a lot of figuring out to do. So did you um, did you find your voice changed at all? Like once totally. it did come back? Completely. Oh yeah, my voice is. I can't sing nearly as high as I could before. I have no falsetto anymore. Um, uh, my voice was always raspy when I gave it, but now right. it's a lot more raspy. I mean, my speaking voice is raspy. Is more and. Uh, I don't know, it fits me better. It's, it suits me better, actually, to be honest, my personality and stuff. Uh, I miss the high range and falsetto because I love the Jeff Buckley kind of stuff I used to do. But, yeah. I mean, uh, I'll trade that for a little bit more soul, I guess. Now. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I've earned it. I mean, uh, it, the life I lived for a long time was pretty crazy. And, you know, with the surgery and everything, I mean, my voice is where it is for a reason. And, you know, um, mostly I have no one to blame but myself for that. And so, right. you know, I had to learn to accept that and learn to deal with what I had now. And I, and I love it. I feel really confident in it. I actually think I'm a way better singer now. I just can't sing as high. Do you, um, do you still play any of your stalled out material? We do once in a while. With this band, because this, 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 this record's way more roots rock. Yeah. And so stalled out was more Brit pop kind of stuff. And like, uh, you know, my, the, the idea for me back then was to be like, a, like what an Ed Sheeran became. Like, uh, you know, there's guys like Scott Hellman, guys like uh, Sean Mendes, Sean, I forget his name, crap. The, uh, the young guy that's on Warner, like they 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 do yeah. they do lots of that, right? And, and when I was there, they had uh, Sexsmith, who I love to death and admire. But I'm not like that. I'm a lot more gritty than those guys. I have a lot more rock in me than those guys. And even when I signed to Warner, um, I had a lot of rock stuff they didn't choose for the records, right? Right. Um, so not heavy rock, just more rocking. And so uh, I um, <sighs> we play some of the songs from that stuff, but it's it's. You know, they don't, right now, we've lately just been doing anything from this record. Yeah. But we do pull out, uh, not like this sometimes, we do pull out Sorry again sometimes. Um, and then from the second record, there's a bunch of songs that we could do, but I mean, no one even knows the record even came out, really. Until I was prepping this interview, yeah. I didn't know it existed. I did a song with John, of Julian Le with Julie yeah. Lennon. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and Chris Potter. Chris Potter. But I, I had loved the first. I, I had, I had, <laughs> I had uh, Steve White, who played with Oasis, and Paul Weller. Yeah. Uh, I had all these crazy guys, all these crazy musicians. And I think it's a good record. It's just... It's just more. Over, I think both of my, my my last records were overproduced, and not anyone's partic in particular's fault. It just was overproduced and wasn't where I should have been. It yeah. wasn't where I should be going. So it took me four years after that last record, you know, of, of trial and error and hooking up with Dave King. I was playing drums with me, but also was co-producer on this. 
um, uh, who really kind of said, man, what do you want to do? Yeah. And a lot of people at Warner when I was with them were worried that I wanted to do like heavy rock or something, which I'm, I'm not a heavy rocker at all. I like rock and stuff. I like things that have grit, but I'm not yeah. like a metal guy or anything. And uh, this, this record came about uh, in a really natural way and it just felt like my influence is, you know, I'm a big Sam Cooke fan, big Otis Redding fan, but I'm also a huge Tom Petty, Neil Young, uh, the band, uh, all that kind of rootsy, rocky, almost Americana rock, I don't know what it is really, but that kind of stuff. And then new bands like Kings of Leon, Alabama Shakes, and guys like Nathaniel Rayliff and Chris Stapleton, like these soul, there's a lot of soul in their music and that's what I was missing. I think. I was missing that in my in my older stuff, and right? So we don't do too much of it. We, we, we're I'm thinking of doing a, a kind of a cover record of myself where I take the best songs from the last two records and do them with, with this band the way that this stuff's all turned out. Yeah. And just just to have them, not to sell it, really, just to just to have it out there to see what it would feel like. Because live when we do them, they feel great. It's just we haven't been playing too much. Have someone else do that for you. Take that into a studio and yeah. say, hey, we'll do these sessions. Yeah. Right? Yeah, if I if I had the cash, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would do it. <laughs> um, you mentioned you mentioned Dave King. How did how did you meet him originally? So Dave and I met through the Hamilton music scene. Uh, Dave was working with Steve Strongman, who okay. was a Juno winning blues artist and a good friend of mine. Steve plays all over this record. He's playing okay. guitar on this record. Um, <clears throat> and it was a funny chance meeting. How how we ended up working together was a chance meeting. I was playing at a empty bar one night when I came home from Ireland after doing after. A whole bunch of stuff. I was basically I had nothing left. I was kind of just trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life. You know, I had a, hundreds of songs. I just wasn't playing. I wasn't yeah. doing anything. Um, and so I started taking these gigs. I was playing these bar gigs, and uh, in walks Dave King with um, Arlo Guthrie's daughter, Woody oh, nice. Guthrie's granddaughter, yeah, and yeah. Um, her, uh, her partner. And uh, they sit down, and I think also um, Ethan Johns, his girlfriend was there. His wife was there too, he was from Hamilton. So I was pretty nervous. I was like, oh gosh, there's like people heavy people I can play. So I started playing and Dave came up to me afterwards and literally goes, What the fuck are you doing? That's what he said to me. Just straight up front. I was like, What? Like we knew each other but not yeah. super well. I was like, What do you mean, man? And I was like, I'm working, I don't know, I'm playing. He goes, Yeah, but what the fuck are you doing? Like, are you writing? Are you doing record? Like you're just sitting here wasting money playing bars? Like what are you doing? And because uh, I played a couple originals during the set. He's like, man, I gotta tell you. He's like, you know, I hear these other records here, and I know you've been around doing all this, doing stuff before, and you've kind of been missing for a while. But uh, he's like, you, got, you know, I really like your songs, and it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect between what I've heard and what you're doing, what you sound like. Like, and then we got into the whole conversation of what we just had about, you know, what I think about my last records and what I think about the idea of what I was portrayed as or push, kind of being pushed as, right. as, to, as compared to what I really am. And he said, man, why don't you come up to the bar? And he has a great studio called Barn Window Studios. He said. Why don't you come up and just you know let's let me hear these songs? I'd love to hear what you're doing. Just jam, hang out. And he actually was doing a record, and he asked me. He was like, "I want you to write with me on my record." That's what started the whole thing. Well, I was oh, cool. I wasn't even thinking about a record at that yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I went up and we did that. And at the same time we were doing that, Slate uh, Slate Music, who I'm with now, uh, Gary and uh, Derek Ross, who works for Slate, they always hire me to do these these. Uh, Kind of radio contest things where we write for band, write with and for bands right. for these radio contests. So I was doing that, and I played a, uh, one of the songs that's on this record, and Derek was like, "Holy, I'll sign you right now!" And I was, I wasn't even interested. I was like, "No, <laughs> no, I'm just working, man." And uh, you know, eventually the relationship between Dave and I grew, and you know, uh, I started showing Derek some of the some of the things we'd be doing, and it kind of all came together, and that's how we ended up working together right now. Now. Uh if I had to put a descriptor to you, like a one-word descriptor, I think I would I would go with uh, introspection. Oh. That's kind of what your songs. That's bring very in. introspective. I, I've 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 said that for years that I think I'm a very introspective writer. I don't I don't write about you know false things. I don't write about you know I don't make things up. I write about whatever. Sometimes I'm using metaphors or whatever, but I, it's yeah. always about my life. Yeah, right. That's what I know best, I guess. And from the sounds of things, life's been pretty uh, pretty rough for the past few years. You've yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty I'm pretty off. I, 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 I'm optimistic about life. Like I'm always, I feel like I get through anything, whatever. Yeah. But you know, we are, we're all handed a lot of cards in life. I just, I just there's a bunch that came in a row for me, and uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, I got bitter for a little while, and I was kind of frustrated for a little while. Yeah. But then my mother passed away, and that just superseded everything that I was bitter about. Every chip on my shoulder, everything. It just made everything pale in comparison. And you go, give your head a shake, man. Yeah. Like, who cares about any of this stuff? Just, just be happy. We're gonna be happy and. 
starting to do 11, make your mother proud, and stuff. And so it was a complete turning point in my life uh, almost four years ago where, um, you know, I, I just I started seeing things a little differently and, you know, working towards a better life for myself, I think. The 14 songs that are on Yukon Hotel, were they things that you wrote after your mom passed away, or was this all stuff from the Some. Dreams, it's a mix. Like, There's yeah. mostly newer songs in the last four years. There's a couple songs from, fuck, the songs from almost 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. so I've, I've got like, I had like 200 and some songs coming into this record, so there was a lot of stuff to go through, um, and uh, a lot of crap. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, there's some there's some decent stuff, and so uh, we we just found what tone of the record seemed to be and where I was going, and then what songs fit best with where I was going. Because I write all different kinds of stuff, and yeah. this this felt most uh, true to where I felt I wanted to be. All these songs. One of my favorite lyrics um, on the album is off of Liberty, and that's, you get just enough to keep on going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, to me, that's that's life. I mean, that's... It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm from a place, I'm from Hamilton, uh, and uh, in Hamilton, I lived on, if you know Hamilton, this is a mountain, this downtown, so I lived on the mountain for, uh, you know, when I was young, and then I moved downtown when I was like four, 13, 14, and uh, I spent all my, my uh, adolescent years down there in the uh, Barton Gage area, tough tough neighborhood yeah. and you know you see people toiling and trying and doing everything they can to scrape by you know good people bad people people in the middle whatever and uh just you know not many of them made it to that they didn't get the nice house they didn't get that they just yeah they got by and you know even me in my life i mean i have a lot of good opportunities but i get by and i don't know i'm a millionaire i don't have lots of money none of the guys in my band do like yeah. and uh you know liberty is a thing the, the idea of it is great but it's a big giant carrot that uh in front of most of us, not all of us get there, you know, and that, yeah. that's how the song came about. I don't often read bios where the description for the artist is a big, unrefined ginger bastard. Because uh, that, that's your words? Uh, yeah, somebody took me, <laughs> <laughs> somebody quoted me on that one. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty true, I guess. <laughs> um, if you didn't have music as an outlet for some of the stuff that's happened to you in your life, where do you think you'd be right now? I don't know, I could have been in trouble. Uh, a lot of my friends were in trouble. You know, um, one of my best friends actually was just killed in Hamilton. Uh, and I sent out for the police. And uh, it was pretty crazy. I easily could have been there. Him and I we, you know, grew up together. Right. And I didn't go that way. I mean, music, he actually introduced me to music. He actually pushed me towards music because he loved music when we were kids. And I got into it and he got into gangs and stuff like that. And I easily could have went that way. Um, but I think uh, as I got older, I have a severe, severe love for nature. So, uh, and being outdoors, so I think, um, not severe in a bad way, like a good way. A good way yeah. I truly believe, uh, you know, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be working somewhere out in the woods, doing something, or trying to, anyways. Cool. Hopefully. <laughs> um, one of the songs I like the most on the album is Opportunity. I like the yeah. slide, the slide guitar that's Oh, yeah, on that. yeah, yeah, it's Aaron Goldstein. I have a video of that exact so solo that I sent to everybody after, when he did it, and at the end of it, we just went, holy shit. Yeah. Like, one, just one take, one lesson, didn't even, just, okay, let's go, boys. And he nailed it. Nice. One, one thing, uh, Eric, that was crazy. Nice. That song, that song's funny. That's a song about the, that's a song about the carrot as well. It's another dangling carrot song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess to, to finish off, is there, is there maybe an aspect to writing music that you find particularly challenging? Aspect? Um... <sighs> I guess it depends. Like I don't, I don't have a hard time writing songs. I write lots of songs. I, I feel like I, I, I do pretty well there. But knowing what's what in the business, you have to. Like I, for me, I just had to completely not even think about the business. Yeah, I had to not think about record deals or anything like that. I just had to do what I'm doing and pick songs that I like because I realize that I am not hip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I just don't have. It's not. I'm not up with fashion. I'm not up with what's cool. I'm not up with that. I just play music that. I guess feels musical to me, and uh, that's that's the hardest part for me is, is you know keeping up with the Joneses because I really don't. I kind of I kind of oblivious to what's going on in music, and it's a hard thing. Some people do that really well. I just am not one of them. So yeah. I'm happy playing you know in the barn where we work and did all this record. Like I just want to play uh, in front of people that you know get that kind of music, and that's a it's a really hard thing to kind of uh, figure out how to be successful in today's today's game. You know? Yeah, I think it was hard back in the day. It's, I think it's, it's different kind of hard now. Totally different know, kind of hard. Completely different kind of hard. And some people get it. Some people get it and they're on it and they know it. And, you know, uh, they, they know how to read trends and read what's cool, what's not. And, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. 
I'm saying it's definitely not for me. Yeah. I, I would rather revert and regress into more of a roots world and into the, you know, just sweat it out and play it out and get, get you know, a bit greasy with people in a, gig, in a, in a, in a small club and, and uh, do, it, do it the way that I, that I saw it being cool growing up, that I wanted to do. And, you know, if I miss the boat on what's happening now, then you know, I'll keep paddling along somehow. <laughs> yeah, true. That's it. Well, thanks so much for having me. Right, no problem. Brother. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.